The words of a dying man are always cherished and remembered by friends and family. Today, we who are followers of Jesus of Nazareth recall his last words, his words uttered in pain. His seven last words, those short seven phrases that he pronounced on the cross. When Jesus' preaching caused some of his disciples to abandon him, the Lord turned to his apostles and said, Will you leave me also? And it was Peter who answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And again the gospel says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. All of Jesus' words bring life, betoken love, and fill us with hope. And although we enjoy listening to the parables and the beautiful sermons of the Gospels, we know that on the cross, Jesus preaches his greatest sermon on love. Greater love has no one than the one who lays down his life for his friends. St. Francis of Assisi used to call the cross his book. Look at the cross today. Read the message of love. Read of the power of God to transform ugliness into beauty, evil into good, death into salvation. Today we stand at the foot of the pulpit of the cross. Speak, Lord, thy servant listens. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus' first words on the cross are not a curse, not a threat, not words filled with revenge or indignation or self-righteousness. Jesus turns to his Father not to ask him to rain down fire on his enemies, but to ask for forgiveness from the Father of all mercies, the Father who makes his sun shine on the good and the evil and sends his rain on the just and the unjust. He asks his Father to forgive even this, Jesus isn't like us. He doesn't wait for the wounds to be healed or the offense forgotten. He doesn't wait until he gets over it. In the very greatest moment of pain and humiliation, not even waiting for anyone to ask to be pardoned, Jesus says, Father, forgive them. And as if that weren't enough, Jesus wants to make excuses for us. He says, They know not what they do. Jesus asks us, his followers, to know how to forgive. That's the very minimal requirement for being a disciple, to be able to forgive. How many times do I have to forgive my brother when he offends me? Seven times, St. Peter asks. Surely, Peter was hoping that Jesus would say, well, seven times is about enough. And then the eighth time, well, you can really let him have it. But Jesus says, we must forgive 70 times seven. In other words, stop counting. Keep on forgiving. And we say, Jesus, all right, we'll stop counting. We'll keep forgiving. But do we have to forgive everything, no matter how great the offense, no matter how great the crime? Today, Jesus answers that question from the cross. Pardon everything, he says, even this. Blessed are the merciful, they shall receive mercy. We need that mercy. Help us, Lord, to be compassionate. When they brought the adulterous woman to Jesus to stone her, he said, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And then he began to write on the ground, and we figured he was writing the sins of those men. And when they saw their sins... The stones fell from their hands. Help us, Lord Jesus, to confess our sins, to write them in the sand, to look on them so that the stones of accusation will fall from our hands, so that we'll not gossip so much, criticize so much, or judge so much. Help us to pray with your sentiments when we pray every day that very dangerous petition of the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Do we really mean that? 
Do we really want God to forgive us in the same begrudging way that we forgive each other? Lord Jesus, teach us to forgive while it still hurts. Teach us to forgive 70 times 7. Teach us to forgive everything, even this. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. How lucky was that good thief that after a life of violence, of sin, of selfishness and crime, he could still turn to God at the last moment and ask for forgiveness. Yet there's a certain sadness in discovering God at the end of our life when we have nothing to offer him but the burnt out flame of our love. When St. Augustine finally gave himself to God, he lamented that it was so late. He lamented that he'd strayed so far and so long. In his confession, he writes that beautiful prayer, late have I loved thee, O fairness so ancient and yet so new. Late have I loved thee. May the sight of Jesus crucified melt our hearts and lead us to repentance as it did the good thief. May we too long to be near the Lord, near to our crucified Savior, both in this life and the next. You know, I've always been fascinated by these words of Jesus to the good thief. They're the words that the Eastern Rite Catholics pray before communion. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He doesn't ask Jesus to save him from the cross or stop the pain or let him lead his life over again. He asks only that Jesus remember him. In this, the good thief is like the prodigal son. He's aware of his unworthiness. When the prodigal son went to his father, he said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm not worthy to be your son. Just let me be a servant in your household. But the prodigal son's father won't hear of this. He restores him to sonship immediately. He receives him as a son. He puts a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, and he kills the fatted calf to, his, to celebrate the return of his son. And so it is on the cross. Jesus tells the good thief that he won't have to be remembered because he's going to be there himself in paradise today. Lord Jesus, at our last hour, grant us the grace of sorrow for our sins. Grant us the strength to accept the pain of our agony, knowing that the cross is the door to glory. And may we hear the words of consolation that the good thief heard. This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. When Jesus saw his mother, and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. And then he said to his disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. In the passage of the gospel, there's great solemnity, not just unfinished business in these moments. The poor and suffering servant who has nowhere to lay his head but on the wood of the cross, bequeaths his treasure, his only possession, his mother, to his beloved disciple, John. The gospel doesn't identify Mary or John by their names, but rather by their vocations. Mary is called mother. John is called the disciple whom he loved. Mary was standing at the foot of the cross watching her only son being tortured. Yet she stood there with great dignity as the prophecy of Simeon was being fulfilled. In thy own heart a sword shall pierce. And the prayer in that pierced heart of Mary was the same prayer that so many years ago she said to the angel, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy word. Jesus, despite his pain, is always thinking about other people's pain. He sees his mother who loves him more than any other human being. He knows that she would gladly be nailed to the cross in his stead. 
He knows that she is now alone, a widow without any other children, no one to take care of her. And so he entrusts her to his beloved disciple, John, the son of Zebedee. And John takes Mary into his home and into his heart. But when he gives his mother to his beloved disciple, he is giving her to all of his disciples. She is our mother because she's mother of the Lord. The Acts of the Apostles tell us that the Apostles persevered in prayer in union with Mary. May she help us to persevere in prayer and in fidelity. And when we, like young John, stand by the cross, may the Mother of Sorrows accompany us to help us to stand with faith and with dignity. Fear of the cross, fear of suffering, is what makes us so mediocre. Fear is what made all the apostles flee from Calvary, all except the youngest, the baby. And John's courage was greatly rewarded. He got to take Mary into his home. Behold thy mother, behold our mother. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These words that Jesus prays from the cross are taken from the 22nd Psalm. They divided my garments, on my vesture they cast lots. Many of Jesus' last words are actually quotes from the Psalms in which we catch a glimpse of the inner life of Jesus. Jesus, the man of prayer, the man who from his tenderest years prayed the Psalms at Mary's knees at the synagogue in Nazareth and in the temple in Jerusalem and in the Garden of Olives. And now as he faces death, the words of the Psalms jump to his lips. If any of you have been with a dying person, you have heard them pray those familiar prayers. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Today, Jesus prays the 22nd Psalm again, and it takes on new meaning because he's facing death. Jesus is really suffering, suffering physically, suffering psychologically. He feels abandoned by God, betrayed by his followers, rejected by his own people. This Psalm Jesus prays is very dramatic. It's a prayer of someone who is suffering and looking and struggling to make sense out of it all. But it's not, as some would say, a prayer of despair. The psalm expresses a whole gamut of emotions. It moves all the way from blaming God through the reassertion of faith and the certainty that deliverance would come to the conviction that the whole world will acknowledge God's goodness. It's an honest prayer of extraordinary nobility prayed by the Israelites from the time of King David by many who suffered persecution and famine and disease and failure and personal loss. And now it's prayed by Jesus as death approaches. Jesus finds strength in the words of the common prayer of the community of faith, whose words become the voice of his own heart. My God, my God, why? In times of pain, we all ask why. Why me? Why now? Why this? Help me, Lord, to know that you suffered these same feelings of being forsaken. Help me to know that you are with me when I feel most alone. I need not ask why, but why not? I thirst. Jesus never complains. It's one glimpse of Jesus' suffering. Jesus' throat is as dry as a brick. His lips are cracked with fever. His head is reeling with dizziness, and he cries out, I thirst. The same Jesus who turned gallons and gallons of water into wine so that no one would go thirsty at the wedding feast of Cana himself has nothing to drink. They gave him some cheap wine or vinegar, as the psalm had prophesied. They put poison in my food. They gave me vinegar to drink. But Jesus' thirst is not just for water. Jesus' thirst is for us. It's like that old English song that says, Drink to me only with thine eyes, and I will pledge with mine. 
or leave a kiss within the cup, and I'll not ask for wine. Jesus wants us to drink to him with our eyes, to behold his suffering. His thirst for us is like a deer longing for running streams, like the parched earth longing for the gentle rains. So my soul thirsts for you. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for holiness. Blessed are they who thirst for the living waters that only Jesus can give. It is finished. How beautiful these words of Jesus. How wonderful that he can say, it is finished. In 33 short years, he finished all that he had to do. He went about doing good. He did all things well. He made the blind to see and the lame to walk. His food was to do the will of the one who sent him. He worked in the carpenter shop with Joseph for many years in Nazareth, in humility and obscurity. He preached and he healed. He befriended sinners and outcasts. And he formed a little group of motley followers. And now he embraces the cross to save the world. Would that each and every one of us could say, it is finished when our life comes to end. Would that our household be in order so that we would not have to beg God for more time in order to be able to go and make peace with our relatives, reconcile ourselves to our neighbor, or give some money to the poor whom we've neglected so many years, or to ask for time to make a good confession that we've been putting off, or ask for time so that I can tell my wife and my children and my friends that I love them. It's been so long, I wonder if they know. Will we need time to return the things that we borrowed? Will we need time to pray so that we can get to know God, so that when we present ourselves to him after death, we won't do so as strangers? Yes, let us live our lives as Jesus did doing all things well, doing the will of the Father so that when the end comes, with great peace and serenity, we can say, it is finished. I have run the race. I have fought the fight. I have kept the faith. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Jesus once again makes his own, the words of the Psalms, and he entrusts himself to the Father in a prayer of abandonment. Jesus truly hands his life to a loving father with all the pain and the fear that often surround our last moments on earth. Jesus shows us what death was meant to be for a Christian, an act of giving, giving our life back to the father. Jesus' whole life is an act of giving and his death crowns his life by being a gift, a gift given freely a gift given with love. And it's because of that gift that we call the day that he died Good Friday. Today, the cross casts a shadow over the face of the earth. Today, Jesus abandons himself to the loving hands of his Father. O oh Lord Jesus, help us to do the same. Into your hands, O Father, I abandon myself. Mold my life as clay, as a potter does. Give me a form or break me into pieces, as your will commands me. What do you want me to do? What don't you want me to do? Whether I be praised or insulted or understood or slandered, give me the strength to say, Father, into your hands I give my life. Help me to love the cross. Don't send me heroic crosses that fuel my vanity, but humble and vulgar little crosses that I carry with repugnance. Crosses that I experience in the contradictions of life when my friends forget me, when people judge me to be worse than I really am, when I fail to achieve, when I suffer the pains of humiliation, the pains of growing old, when the parts of my body that don't hurt don't work the cross of my intellectual limitations, the cross of my boredom, the frustrations of opportunities lost. Help me 
to carry all of these crosses because I love you. I place my life in your hands with infinite trust because you are my Father. Into your hands I commend my life. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight and we look forward to being with you tomorrow.